debt ceiling or banking turmoil? What are you most worried about? Happy to be here. So I think the debt ceiling is potentially catastrophic. Yeah. So that, that's a whole different issue. Hopefully it won't happen. You know, the banking crisis, I still believe, will kind of sort its way through. And it's not anything like 08 or 09. Uh, only a couple of people offsides with all these various things, which you knew about. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, you know, it's getting near the tail end of that. But if you're Janet Yellen right now, what would you do differently? I don't know. I think we need to finish the bank crisis. I think we've been we've had uncertain policy on mergers, this first horizon deal. I think we have to assume there'll be a little bit more. Yeah. So you know, whatever the FDIC, the OCC, the Federal Reserve, you know, whatever they need to do to, to uh, make it better, they should do. Be thoughtful, be very forward looking, you know, not be surprised constantly. Because some of these things have been known about for quite a while. And so uh, we've handled three, SVB, Signature, First Republic, and so but I think it's very important. The regional banks, who I've been speaking to like every day for the last week, they're quite strong. You know, they're quite worried because of the you know run on deposits like that. But their financial results are good. Their yeah. financial results are going to be good. Okay, next quarter. You know, they're earning money. They got very good clientele. Very diversified. Uh, uh, and they're they're but quite are strong. So, Jenny, for like a comprehensive solution. So, if you're asking Janet Yellen to get the job done, what does that look like? That solution. I'm not asking for a comprehensive solution. Why not? Just be prepared for problems. There's no. We don't need a comprehensive solution. What do we need right now? Do we do we need regulators to look at short sellers of banks? Yes. You know, like, look, my folks would tell me that that's not the problem, the short selling ban. If you actually analyze stocks yeah. and short sales, it's not, doesn't seem that big a deal. I think they may partially be wrong uh, because, as you know, some people are unscrupulous and they use other means to go short. I think that if, but if you look at the detail, the SEC has the enforcement capability to look at what people are doing by name in, in options, derivatives, short sales. And they should go, if someone's doing anything wrong, people are in collusion, or people are going short and then making a tweet you know, about a bank, they should go after them, and, and, and vigorously. And they should be punished to the full extent the law allows it. So uh, I think it's possible it's taking place. We have no evidence of it. No. But you know, my experience in life has been, don't, don't assume too much. Do, do you think that they're looking into it? I hope so. I don't know. When you look at some of the position of J.P. Morgan, of course, you didn't really buy any long-dated bonds. And at the time, a lot of people said, look, stop hoarding cash. Do you think regulators and investors had pushed some of these banks to, to take unwarranted risk? Yes, I do. But let's be clear. The people to blame are the bank CEOs and the bank boards and things like that. Having said that, I think there's been a humility on the part of regulators that, there, that the Federal Reserve itself never forecast interest rates going up. Not one Fed governor forecast it. And whether you forecast it or not, you should be stress testing people for it. Their stress tests always had low rates. We always knew about uninsured deposits. And there were huge incentives that banks to put securities and held to maturity, lower capital requirements. Huge incentives to own treasuries, lower capital requirements, and they counted for liquidity. And I, I'm hoping all that gets looked at. And they should look at it and say, yeah, OK, we were a little bit part of the problem, as opposed to just pointing fingers. So this is what not a regulation problem, it's a supervision problem. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. They, they, they become very related. I mean, supervisors look at, are you are you doing the right thing by regulations? And so, and like even the stress test, I've always thought that you know, when you have one stress test and you have a company completely focused on that for three months, you know, does it lull people to a false sense of security that all these other things aren't going to happen? And all these other things in history always happen. And so you know, I think it was a little bit of a mistake to have one stress test. God, I'm not asking them to do many at this level of detail, but you know, our stress test is 200,000 pages long. Do you think that last 100,000 pages added value? And my view is it did not. Do, do you think but things will change because of this? Is this like a catalyst? I think it's going to get worse for banks. I think that what people... What do you mean by worse? It's just more regulations and more rules and more requirements. I, ho I, I hope they do it very thoughtfully because, you know, if you, we love the community banks, the regional banks. We're the biggest banks of those folks. But, you know, if you overdo certain rules, requirements, regulations, you know, some of these community banks tell me they have, you know, more compliance people than loan officers. You know, and so at one point, you make it harder for them to do business. There are already hundreds of rules in place. And in a lot of ways, it's the mix of the rules. If you're going to change liquidity, maybe not capital. If you're going to change capital, maybe not liquidity. If you're going to add TLAC, then maybe you should do something with deposit insurance. They should, they should sit down and have a very thoughtful conversation about what those things are and what we want the outcome to be. And if you look at the present outcome, a lot of things are leaving banks. And they should. 
You know, I'm not, and if that's what they want, so be it. But that should be done with the forethought. That should not be done because you're just putting rules and regulations in place and you don't know the consequences. The mortgage business, for example, is, you know, largely, not largely, 80% out of the banks today. And just be careful about what you, what you wish for. So you bought First Republic. You've had, I imagine, now a good look at what's inside it. What did you find out? Yeah, no, we had a good look before we bought it. We, okay, that, we that's had, reassuring, but anything that you we, found out We had 800 it? people working around the <laughs> clock for a long time to, to look at something like that. And, and, and in reality, look, they did some things really well. Like, if you talk to their customers, I'm getting calls and emails and great, great culture, great customers and things like that. Right. Their credit is kind of pristine. You know, that's good. So, of course, we marked all the market and we're all in very good shape. And we've hedged all the interest rate exposure uh, together. We've got thousands of people now going out, learning about what their best is. We want the best of both. We're not the kind of company that comes in our highway, our way or the highway. And so there's no surprise there. Uh, you know, it's, if, it had to make sense for shareholders. But, you know, this notion, this notion that it was an unbelievable thing, no, it was a nice thing for shows. That's my, I have to do that. But we also really did it to assimilate the bank in a way that's very safe for the system. Uh, and it didn't cost uninsured depositors, didn't cost the FDIC. It cost the FDIC as little as possible. But I also want to point out, I'd be fine if they want to change the rules a little bit to make it easier for, for a regional bank to buy a big bank. And the other thing about big banks, which again is, I know, I know, but the thing about big banks, we need healthy big banks. We have the best banking system in the world. You know, and you want You're that. You're very big. Yeah, but we're not. Banks are becoming smaller and smaller as a part of the global system. So when they look at banks, they say, oh, it's big. But when you look at the banking system to the system, yeah. mortgages have left, a lot of private credits left, certain trading functions have left, a lot of things are going to leave. You have Apple, you have the neo banks, you have. You, right. you better be a little more thoughtful about when you say we mean banking per se. Okay. And so. But, but the, the U.S., the Americans should not fear too much finance consolidation in your hands. No, because you know, most of our size accrues to our clients. So if you look at, you know, we do most, a large, small banks can't do, we do like banking large corporations of 50 countries around the world and move $10 trillion a day. They, you know, it's hard. So these are, these are big, complex things. We're not big and complex we want to be. Yeah. We're big and complex because the people we serve are big and complex. We bank countries, the World Bank. You know, we do a lot of things. And yes, we also bank consumers in the United States. So, but I want the community banks to thrive. I mean, like I said, we want to do everything we can to help them. We didn't want this to happen. We didn't no. cause it to happen. The second it happened, we, we knew it was bad for all banks. But and are you too big to fail? I don't know what that word means anymore. I mean, we're not going to fail, and I don't know what that means. But we certainly didn't mean it to be an advantage. Like, uh, uh, so, you know, we've asked all our people when this crisis happened, I don't want anyone soliciting any client or any banker from any, of the, any right. bank that's, you know, regional bank or community bank, et cetera. So, um, is, is there anything else that you'd, be, that you'd be buying? I mean, some of the smaller banks fall, no. you know, fall in, I that's it. it. No. I mean, we're going to have a lot of blowback on having bought this one, but it was the right thing to do, you know, but uh, we'll get the blowback. But again, my job is this, people at this thing, they always look at like the financial deal. Forget the financial deal. 800 people working around the clock, 10,000 people deployed now to consolidate systems, risk, fraud, credit, payments, branches, real estate, vendors, technology. It's a lot of work. You know, and it distracts us from those other things. And so, uh, you know, like I said, we did it. It, it was marginally beneficial for shareholders. Yeah. It was good for the system, but, uh, and, you know, we got now we have to be prepared for the other side of that mountain. Uh, how worried are you about the debt ceiling? So Donald Trump yesterday in a town hall with CNN, A, did not seem too worried, and two, actually told Republicans to stick to their guns. Well, it's one more thing he doesn't know very much about. Uh, it, 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 let me put it in two categories. One is actual default. That is potentially catastrophic. And you can go through a million ways, and, but everyone, anyone, anyone knows that's potentially catastrophic. And I don't think it's going to happen because it gets catastrophic. And the closer you get to it, you will have panic. And so the closer you get, you have markets get volatile. Maybe the stock market go down. The treasury markets will have their own problems. It's amazing you already have certain T-bills trading 3% and right next to them 5%. This is not good. And people should remember the American financial system is the foundation to the to the global economic system. And so, and the closer we get, more panic. We might get downgraded. The last time we were downgraded, we had like 65 or 70 percent debt to GDP. Now it's 105. Now our deficits are two or three times that that we had back then. So, you know, we better be very careful. And I wish we didn't get there at all. I'm respectful of both sides. 
who, you know, one side wants to use it to make up for. We've got Jim down there, throats, you know, and I'm, I would love to get rid of the debt ceiling thing, but please negotiate a deal. Do, do you think that it'll be, at the end of the day, the markets that will spur a deal? That we have to get to it, the point where there's, where there's panic? It, it's a really bad idea. Because pa panic becomes something that is not good, and it could affect other markets around the world. But yes, at the end of the day, if it gets to that panic point, people have to react. And we've, we've seen that before. And the other thing about markets is always remember, panic is the one thing that scares people. Like, they, they take irrational decisions. I remember even in 08, people were selling certain securities at 40% of what they would be worth if we had a Great Depression. But they were like, I want out, I want cash, I'm not betting my, my family's money on this or my company's money. People will panic. And that, again, we got to be very careful about getting close to a situation that causes that. Did you get a call from Janet Yellen about this? I'm not going to talk about personal calls I'm getting. I, we've all spoken about debt ceiling. I mean, everyone, that's, that's everyone. There's no. But for um, big banks, are you ready? To, actually, how do you prepare for a, a we, possible we have defense? A, group of people who are very smart, who are looking at, again, it's very unfortunate, it's, it's time consuming, hopefully it won't happen, but it, it affects contracts, collateral, clearing houses, clients, it affects clients differently around the world. You have to then anticipate what people are going to do, which is very different than the legality of it. And, uh, you know, and the closer we get, the more those, kind of that war room will start. Now it's taking place once a week, but my guess is sometime, in, call it May 21st, it'll be every day. And then it'll be three times a day. And then it'll be much more conversation with clients about what they need to do to help to get them through it and things like that. It's very unfortunate. It should never happen this way. I mean, Fortress Diamond is always about the balance sheet. Should there be a special commission looking at you know, debt in the U.S. That, that you should run? Oh, God, no. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I don't want to. On China? They went after tech. They're looking now at finance. What kind of message does it tell companies that want to do business there? Well, I, I think when you say they're looking at finance, it's been very limited. They've been very much more careful about touching the, the financial system or outsiders. But look, this is a serious subject. And anything that relates to national security, I'm a patriot first, and I'm going to salute my government. So put that, but put that aside. What the government should do and wants to do and is now saying they are going to do is have conversations. They're going to be tough, but they should be thoughtful. Certain things are really national security, certain things are not. Yeah. You know, and we shouldn't confuse the two. America and China have a lot of common interests, climate, nuclear proliferation, anti-terrorism, global stability, you know, and we have differences. You know, we're capitalists, they're not, you know, and it's okay. We could sort it out, but, but we need to keep the Western alliances together, not just around war and Ukraine, but around strategic economic relationships, including trade, including trade. We can't take trade off the table every time we talk to you know, Europe or Asia and stuff like that. So I would go back into TPP. I would surround the world. I'd want to keep the world safe for democracy, and I'd want to have open markets, particularly with uh, Europe. And I, when I was here last time, it was when we passed the IRA Act. A lot of great things in that act. But there are things I don't like, like too much social engineering inside of it, and but also it pissed off all of our allies. But Jamil, like, on the China side, so if they if they start doing more noise on finance, does that hurt Chinese growth? Like probably, I think you've already seen. Uh, uh, it's not trade, but you've seen investment going both ways coming down, and and that's okay in the short run, but in the long run, we should say what we're and the government's got to decide. This is, this is not going to be you know, business companies decide, nor should they. So when Congress criticizes business sometimes, okay, there, there may be truth to that. They have to decide what is okay, what's not okay, what do they want, what's security. And that's around trade, that's around investment, and that's around sharing IP. Okay, I give you a million pounds, or maybe you take a, you know, your own million pounds. Where do you invest Jake right Morgan. now? Uh, I, wouldn't buy, I, I, I wouldn't buy sovereign debt anywhere. Why? I think there's too much... Uh, I don't, I, the amount of fiscal stimulus took place and still surging through the system, the amount of QE, these were extraordinary numbers. And not just in the U.S., but in Europe and in other parts of the world. And when I say extraordinary, I mean extraordinary. And therefore, it, it, I think there's a chance you have more inflation than people think. So while the Fed controls short rates, they don't completely control longer rates. And then you could see longer rates ticking up because of higher inflation. And even if there's a mild recession, they continue to tick up. You know, a lot of us experienced that in the 70s and 80s, and I would be a little worried about that. So rates are kind of low. Spreads are still kind of low. Okay, so you're not putting them in sovereign. Where are you putting that million? I'm, 
central banks. For, for stability, if you look at fragmentation, I mean, the, the world seems a little bit odd, like equities are doing one thing, but we keep on being told there's a recession. Why is there this massive idiosyncrasy? Okay, that's the contradiction. There's still consumers in America, job, unemployment 3.5%, right. home prices have gone up for 10 or 15 years, uh, stock prices have gone up for 10 or 15 years, they have a trillion dollars more in their checking accounts, they're spending that money. You see it in travel, you see it in restaurants, you see it in, ho you've been around here, you see it in hotels, you see it, that's all good, but the excess money is being spent down. So the bite of that will, is gonna happen later this year, early next year, and the bite of QT hasn't happened yet. So if you have higher inflation, so I think it's a reasonable thing to say those things are coming to fruition maybe when? sometime in the end of the year. Yeah. We don't know the effect of that. You know, if there's a, I mean, I would take a mild recession happily right now. I am far more concerned about geopolitics, Ukraine, trade, you know, Russia, our relations with China, and et cetera. And I always have to remind all of our public, America has a 75,000 per person GDP. China's is 15. We have all the food, water, and energy we want. They import 10 million barrels of oil a day. I mean, it's not, they're not a 10-foot giant and us a 4-foot pygmy. We have to manage ourselves better. I think we can grow more, be more thought, thoughtful. In the market, so, you know, a lot of people say it's commercial real estate. I mean, we talk about nothing else. Everybody knows that that could break. Is there something that we're not seeing that could break? I think it's amazing when you talk about markets that sometimes it's, and the press sometimes, like a bunch of birds flocking to one thing with endless comments about it. Yes, that's an issue. So, you know, if you look at office uh, real estate, in B and C real estate with private property, um, Chicago, New York, Portland, Seattle, uh, but probably not Nashville, Tampa, Orlando, Miami, et cetera. So you gotta, you gotta be a little more thoughtful about it. And I think if I remember the number, banks have 600 billion of office commercial real estate. You know, they had a cushion. So even if it dropped in value, they still have equity in it. Maybe some of that will go bad, particularly if there's a recession. They're, they're, they're gonna be okay. It, it may take a few banks down. That's normal stuff that isn't abnormal. What is abnormal is the war, trade, the future of democracy. That is abnormal. I'm much more concerned no, about that than how the markets trade that. Right. If there's a big geopolitics, there's there's how do the markets talk them? I don't do that. Know. Okay. But, but, look, if I was a, we're, we're cautious. Yeah. You know, I remind people, I'm not. Businesses aren't there to trade us sometimes. They're to serve yeah. our clients, okay? And so we're gonna serve our clients no matter what happens. Yeah. James, very quickly, final question. How are you feeling about the Epstein deposition this month? I, I am so sad that we had any relations with that man whatsoever. You know, we had top lawyers evaluating this. From the SEC enforcement, the DOJ, you know, and obviously had we known then we know today, we would have done things differently, but it's very unfortunate. And I have deep respect for these women. Uh, that doesn't mean we're liable for the action of an individual, but I do have deep respect for them. My heart goes out to them, and uh, 